webinar. We are also joined by Colleen Kaplan, the Remote Learning Outreach Specialist for the LTC and leader of the SPARK program, which stands for Supporting Parents and Remote Kids. Colleen will spend some time at the end of the roundtable to give more information about SPARK, including resources you can use at your school. And last but not least, we're joined by Matt Pearsall, Community Manager at Committee for Children. Matt supports social emotional learning educators, advocates, and thought leaders by fostering the development of strong, sustainable communities of practice. Previously, Matt developed research-based SEL curriculum for elementary, middle, and high school students. We're really excited to talk to you about new strategies in SEL over the next 45 minutes. After the session, we'll be sending out a survey uh, just to hear your thoughts and see if you have any further questions that you'd like answered. So, why is social emotional health important? Anxiety and depression are on the rise among US teens with 70% of teens in 2019 saying that the issues are major problems among people in their community. This number has riven, risen especially over the last 10 or so years and students continue to suffer from mental health issues like isolation, anxiety and depression during the pandemic. Social emotional learning or SEL over the past few years has become a buzzword that school administrators, teachers, counselors, parents, and others are using to indicate that schools are recognizing the rising toll of these negative student mental health issues and the, and the, the impact that they're having on students' long-term well-being. The idea is basically that in order for kids to be successful academically, their social and emotional needs must be met first. So with that, we are going to start the round table. And I just want to ask, um, again, all of our participants to please make sure, please welcome, first of all, and please make sure that your video is off throughout the session, um, just so that we can have um, each of our, our four presenters, we can, we can give them some space for that. So um, Matt, Holly, and Colleen, that's a very quick view of SEL. For those who aren't familiar though, and who are in the session, I'm hoping you can explain a little about SEL, what it is and why it's important. Ali or Matt, do you wanna take this one? Sure. Um, so social emotional learning in a nutshell um, is sort of the term that I don't like, but often gets used is, is, is soft skills. It's, the, it's all the things outside of academics that are really critical to people's success in school and in life. Um, things like self-awareness, uh, being able to, um, you know, being able to manage your emotions, recognize your feelings, uh, being able to work with others, be able to be able to, to, um, to do to work collaboratively and to be able to listen and it can in with little kids this can look very this can look like you know literally practicing to listen like 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 putting and in, in stuff I working and putting on your attentoscope and watching um, and and with with high school kids it can look very different and look much more about how do you how do you manage stressful situations and work collaboratively in a ways that 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 doesn't don't rise to become conflicts or, 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 or things like that. And then even among adults, we all, we all practice our social emotional learning skills every day when working with our coworkers and when we're, when we're interacting with our families. And we are all still growing and learning it, even, even we'll be doing it for our entire lives. So that's a real basic kind of d description of what social emotional learning is. Um, and it's something that I think for a lot of us, we learned it when we were kids um, from our families. We learned it kind of implicitly from our teachers and our and educators in our lives. Um, but there's research that shows that this is something that can be that can be successfully taught. Uh, it's not something that we have to learn implicitly from the people around us. And so the recent kind of emphasis on social emotional learning in schools kind of reflects an awareness of this, and that and that by and that not every child has has similar has the has the same access to to um, to models of social of, of social emotional skills in their lives, and that we can help them by by providing access to to kind of thoughtful, actual like planned social emotional learning work um, embedded throughout the school day um, that that every student can need um, and helps kind of level the playing field. 
Yeah, Matt, just to piggyback off of that, and you said it twice, actually, I tend to always associate things with like, I, I lump them all in one word. And I feel as though if I had to lump SEL into one word, it's awareness. So um, I always associate it with that word, meaning um, students learn to be aware of themselves, their emotions, the impact they have on other people, negatively and positively, uh, being socially and culturally aware. Um, and then with that awareness, individuals can make responsible action, um, take responsible actions based off of their wellness, uh, awareness. They're able to set and achieve goals, um, similar to what Matt just referenced to as well. And then also demonstrate that authentic sense of empathy. So um, Matt, I don't know if you've ever thought of SEL in the sense of one word, and that's really difficult to do. I get that. But I feel like it's always comes down to that sense of awareness is that first step in, S in SEL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think awareness is a great place to start. It's something that a speaker told me recently that I was interviewing for something that I was doing for the Spark program is the soft skills, especially things like um, empathy and awareness from social emotional learning. Those are the skills that when our kids get to be adults and are looking for jobs, um, nobody cares what your reading level was. Nobody, nobody cares what grade you got in pre-calculus, but they do care that you, that you have empathy and that you do have mm -hmm. those social emotional skills. And I think um, there's much more of an awareness now of the fact that adults need these skills Mm -hmm. But I don't know if all adults were specifically taught them. There wasn't as much of a focus on them um, when we were in school as yeah. there is now. So I'm hopeful that the new emphasis on it will actually bring maybe a more compassionate generation that's coming yeah. up, or at least one that's more mm -hmm. sort of aware of how their impact and their intention um, can actually be two different things and how yeah. that can affect the people Absolutely. around them. I mean, our, 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 mission at Committee for Children is a safe, safe, is, is safe children thriving in a peaceful world. And we really believe strongly that social emotional learning is a, mm -hmm. is a, is an avenue to that because it is, these are teachable skills. This is something that research is really clear on that. This isn't, these aren't, these aren't inane and born traits in people. Everyone can, everyone can practice and learn and get better at empathy mm -hmm. and problem solving and emotion management. Um, they're very practical and just like, just like math. Yeah. Just like and reading. you know, and also to, um, I just was speaking with a colleague and just talking about what empathy actually is and how it's not guilt and, and the things that it's not is, is important to be able to understand too. And, you know, a lot of the times, even as educators, even when I was in the classroom, um, a lot of times all the students always knew the skills, but as soon as you put them in group work, they didn't know how to navigate. They didn't know how to work together uh, to reach a common goal and be able to uh, communicate their strengths of where they lie and, and every student comes with a skill set whether they see it or not um, or they believe it or not but you know that's also like you know Colleen with those soft skills and being able to um, be productive after after school and in the workforce and SEL and the learning of, of SEL or social emotional learning carries through life it's just not you know learning geometry and then it doesn't apply because we're not using it it's definitely one of those skills that will always follow them and that we all experience as adults here um, we all have a, a set of those skills that we use absolutely thank you all thank you all for that introduction and i just want to welcome again all of our um, participants who have just joined as well um, just asking everybody to keep their video off um, except for the hosts uh, during this part of the presentation and um, please if you have any questions all of our contact information will be at the end of the slides after this discussion um, please feel free to reach out to any of us afterwards visit our websites we'll have a ton of resources that we're sending out to everybody um, on the topic of SEL supporting parents supporting counselors supporting teachers as well um, but we just want to, we want to make sure that this is, this uh, session is focused on dis discussion. So we'll have lots and lots of opportunities for you to reach out, um, ask follow-up questions. Um, but that is why, that's why the chat is disabled, um, just as an FYI. Um, now I want to just move on to the next question, uh, which is about outcomes. And I'm curious if SEL has been linked to better academic performance. So how, if it has, and um, what kind of outcomes do we talk about when we talk about SEL, when we talk about prioritizing mental health and well-being in the classroom? 
Well, there's certainly. Matt, you want to take the lead on this? Yeah, I'll jump okay. in on that. I think that I mean yeah. the, the the first answer is yes. Um, there's really strong evidence yes. that says that it does that 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 strong social emotional uh, skills translate into academic success. Um, the the big study that gets touted there was a a, a very large meta analysis that was done a few years ago uh, that mm -hmm. showed an 11 percent. Um, boost in 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 standardized test scores out um, for students that were receiving high quality social uh, high quality kind of uh, social emotional learning instruction in school um, and there's been recent stuff done around that meta meta analysis actually suggests that might be higher um, so that that that's kind of the big one that you'll hear about a lot uh, there's also research at the higher at the at the in, in at kind of the university level around around the ability of students and specifically students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds or our first or first generation college students um, or our mind or our students from uh, from underrepresented communities that are starting that are that are entering into university that that social emotional learning skills um, are a uh, a predictor of success in making it all the way through college. So there's there's that's kind of a tip of the iceberg in the research when you get into specific parts of social emotional learning, since it's a fairly broad field, you can also see some evidence that will come out um, for support of academic support. The biggest thing that I have really sort of taken to heart, um, I heard from Abby Lyons, who's a social emotional learning educator and coach um, here in the state of Illinois. And she did some sessions and some work with us. And the biggest takeaway that I think a lot of people got from working with her is that our brains and especially our children's brains, it can't function if they're under stress. It doesn't matter how much they're studying their, their times tables or their spelling lists or what you're doing in the classroom. If their brains have not been regulated and you've not worked with them around their stress, no concrete long lasting learning is going to happen. So since we're in a time right now where the whole world is under an extended period of stress that our brains and our really human body are not really capable, are not, they're not built to withstand stress for this long. Um, so our body and our brains are in crisis, even though we may feel fine, um, which is making it really hard for students, especially the younger students, to be able to regulate um, and do well in the classroom. Because if you start doing the math, the proportion of uh, life that has been spent in either quarantine, isolation, seclusion, mm -hmm. remote learning, like I have an almost four-year-old, um, Illinois shut down the week of his birthday. So he's been in isolation with us at home for almost a quarter of his life. And if it's his, you know, aware life, it's, it's closer to half. So when we start looking at it proportionally to how long these kids have been here on earth and aware of what's going on, this is a massive impact to um, how they're functioning. Mm -hmm. It's changing patterns in their brain. Yeah, yeah Colleen also, you are. Colleen, too, uh, I totally agree. And I love the perspective, Colleen, that you said about the, the active and with your four-year-old, because I haven't thought of it in that perspective. And, and that was a great perspective. But it's the same thing, too. Your brain is in panic mode. I think everyone on the call can identify um, with having a moment before going into work physically or remotely where something has happened or there's some days where we feel like we've worked an entire work day before we get to work and um, we're, we're under that chronic stress or something's happening in our lifetime that's not work related, but it's on it's on the forefront of our brains all the time. So students come to class with an entire set of stress, may it be, you know, acute, acute or chronic, they come, they come to us with that stress. And it's hard for them to be able to now just shut that off and begin learning without mm -hmm. knowing strategies um, of how to do that. And, and I think that's what SEL teaches us is we're not getting rid of those stresses. We're just learning how to cope and self-regulate. So then that ripple effect doesn't take place in the class where I'm now upset and now everyone in the class is having an impact because I'm bringing it to there. And then that ripple, like that stone in the water and watching that ripple take place. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a really nice, phrase that I've heard recently says saying Maslow before Bloom 
<laughs> and we need to meet students' basic right. basic needs for survival before we can start tackling their their academic learning. And so I think it's a it's a it's it, it that really kind of captured for me the power of social emotional learning right now in this moment of uh, this moment of of crisis of of um, because I think the hopeful part of this is that there is there is research that shows that doing this work that doing social emotional learning work can be a buffer against against toxic stress against adverse childhood experiences that, that that every child is experiencing to one degree or another right now that that a lot of these negative outcomes that are not just academic they're social they're physical out, effects that can happen um that, that we can we can do something about that by 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 focusing on on kids social emotional learning social emotional well-being and not just kids either um you know teachers Counselors, school staff are also in credible stress. They also need the support, as do families. So, so this is something that we can think about at all kind of levels. Yeah, yeah a lot of people on the call right now may be happy and like, oh man, I could do this. I really could use this in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, kind of um, pivoting off of that as well. I mean, uh, you all have um, you all have have alluded to it as well. I mean, we are. We are in a pandemic right now, and so we are facing um, remote learning environments um, throughout a lot of the U.S. in one way or another. Either having to prepare for for them, maybe you're in them right now. And I'm wondering, um, when we talk about specifically about social emotional challenges in remote environments, um, how are they? What are the social emotional challenges that children are facing um, when? In, in these remote environments, maybe during this pandemic as well, um, that weren't in, weren't issues when they were physically going to school. Yeah, I think um, just to start this conversation, I think uh, first and foremost is just not being able to have your student and be able to read their body language in person, not being able to have uh, eight hours of that time with a student uh, where the majority of their day was spent with a teacher or at school, it's no longer that case. So not being able or having to work differently to pick up on those cues that came very naturally when students were in the classroom. I don't know if Matt or um, Colleen, you want to speak to that, but I think primarily that was probably the first thing that everyone says is they're physically not there to be able to um, take them out of their environment and and get them maybe focused into school and get their brains focused on school, where when the environment's around them, they can't get out of it. They're there, it's always there. Right. I think personally, one of the biggest things missing is that in between time, um, teachers have kids in the building, usually from like say 7.30 to 2.30 or eight to three, whatever it might be. Um, and while there's so much direct instruction happening from bell to bell, there is also um, those times in the hallways, those times as they're packing mm -hmm. up or getting their stuff out, that in between time, which is really where that relationship building happens, that you just miss out on that with this virtual environment because everything in the virtual environment is, you know, scheduled and it's more intentional and you have so little time, you got to make the most of it nobody really has a chance to kind of like just sit and shoot the breeze during lunch. And that's the same for, you know, teachers in working with each other. Um, both Holly and I started at the LTC this August and mm -hmm. like I live up in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago. I'm working out of my living room. I've met my coworkers in person, I think three times <laughs> since mm -hmm. August. And like, even I'm missing out on those intentional bonding moments. And that's what makes you know, working in a school so amazing that what that's what makes being a teacher so special is having that time with your kids and building the relationships. So I think that is one of the biggest parts missing. And when I hear teachers talking about what they're mourning about losing in the school year, that I think is one of the biggest things. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's, community and relationships and yeah. social connections that's, that's the thing that, that, that's the that, <laughs> that's that's what's that's what's lacking it's that's a critical part for student success I mean mm -hmm. it, it's 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 one of those things another kind of going back to race research is clear um that that having a personal connection to your educational experience is really important for success especially for the most vulnerable students that we serve mm -hmm. um and that's just gone it's, I mean, it's totally, totally gone and needs to be rethought and redone in a, in a completely new way. And, and I don't know, and that's hard. It's really hard to do. Um, and, and, 
and I think on top of that, there's an incredible amount of, of stress. Um, what's also happened is most many of the supports that students are used to receiving from school, uh, academic supports and social supports are also gone or radically changed. Um, at the same time that they're being asked to, re just like educators are being asked to relearn how to be educators, students are being asked to relearn how to be students, um, you know, and we're now we're saying, we're asking third graders to do tech support for, for mm -hmm. Zoom calls and, and, and high school students to manage completely online, online self-directed independent learning like that. And, and that's incredibly stressful and kids re react to that stress in different ways. Some rise to the challenge, others become very, very, um, very stressed out and others check out and say enough of this and they're done. And, 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 and again, all of that, a lot of that is also breaks down along, along pre-existing lines of, of, of access to education. And it's our most vulnerable students and students that are furthest from mm -hmm. educational equity who are the most affected by this. Yeah, ac um, accessibility is huge because a lot of the times the kids know the content during remote learning and, and they understand the concepts, but it's just the accessibility of being able to get into the into the Google Meet or figuring out the technology um, is where the difficulty lies. I mean, we even know getting when anyone here, when we're having to coordinate these uh, webinars or sessions, the stress that goes into it naturally that may not be there you know, prior. So absolutely, I agree. Yes, absolutely. Um, technology, especially leading up to using technology for an event like this is um, more stressful, I think, than it, <laughs> it, it needs to be. Um, I can say that from experience for today. Um, so I just want to remind, I, I want to welcome everybody. We still have some people trickling in. Um, just thank everybody for, for joining us again. Um, and to just remember to keep your videos off through the call unless you're presenting and talking. If you have any questions that um, you would like to ask any of our presenters at the end as well, um, please write them down and you will have all of our contact information to send them to afterwards. Um, and we'll also be sending out a survey at the end just to let you know what you let us know what you thought um, and um, answer those questions directly. Um, so kind of moving on to techniques and examples, I'm wondering, um, you know, as we look at how teachers use social emotional learning in a traditional in-person learning environment, um, what kind of techniques can they use that can be extended to remote environments as well? Well, I'll, I'll jump in with, I think some, there's some really simple things that, um, that translate, that okay, translate well, that are still really powerful. Still. And, um, Sorry. and, and I think the most things that jump out is the simple stuff we do to build relationships. So like a, like a teacher standing in this, in the classroom doorway, um, invite saying hello to kids as they come in or, um, or the, or the principal standing at the, at, the, at the school doorway saying hi as people come in, trying to make sure that that stuff is still happening in a virtual sense if you're mm -hmm. doing live classes, um, greeting kids as they come in, even though they may not, they may have their cameras off and you may never ever hear from them. Um, they're still hearing you and hearing those positive and hearing those things can make a big, big difference. Um, that, so that's one yeah. example of something really simple we can do to kind of help bridge that, that divide and start kind of rebuilding relationships. Yeah, putting people, sorry about that, I had connectivity and then it, it was really quiet there for a second. So I was like, oh no, uh, so sorry, Matt, excuse me. I think too, to, to piggyback off that, if you're using um, your live, put students in separate um, breakout rooms and just have one-on-one -on -one and just put all your students in separate rooms. So you, you schedule that time in um, to show that you can still have conversations with your student. It is timed and it's maybe very focused, but maybe that's not a bad thing that all of your attention is on that one student versus maybe 10 kids working or 20 kids working in a class. And now you're talking to that one student, you now have complete isolation just with that, uh, with that student. Also uh, promoting students to turn on their camera um, and having those that communication about why it's important. Uh, with that, encouraging backgrounds. I know there's two very separate camps on backgrounds um, but a lot more students are willing to show their faces if their background is hidden because we, we're now in their homes. Um, and then, you know, depending on age, but all ages, icebreaker games and that, in, that encourage emotional checks is huge. Um, just gauging where our students are and then also to those habits 
the more we do remote learning, we'll pick up on those habits. Um, Colleen may always have her camera on and then all of a sudden for three days, where's Colleen? Her camera's off, what's going on? Um, you know, who are the ones that are always talking and not talking because they don't want to unmute themselves kind of and just then having those conversations and picking up on those patterns is and being observant is important. Mm -hmm. I think a really great tool for that to, um, to take those ideas. If you don't have the ability to do them synchronously while all the student screens are in front of you using um, a tool like Flipgrid, where mm -hmm. you can sort of take that um, like a Zoom call and essentially make it asynchronous where students can record a response to you and you can record a response back to just them that just they can see. And with all of the privacy features on Flipgrid, I love that like you, the rest of the class doesn't even need to see these videos, but it can be a really good way to start hearing from students, giving them that one-on-one -on -one feedback, starting to build those relationships. Um, Cause I know synchronous time, depending on what district you're in, um, can be really limited. Um, and some of you, your synchronous time may actually be half of your kids in front of you, half of your kids at home, and it's not really synchronous. It's really just a hot mess of computer problems. Um, so something like Flipgrid, which can like slow it out, slow it down a bit, um, and really give you the opportunity to focus in on each kid. Um, and you can use it in lots of different ways, lots of different subject areas. It's great with adults. It's great with preschoolers. Um, it's great no matter the subject area. So um, just a little plug for an app that I think works great yeah. for this sort of topic. And and I think a really, a really like straightforward strategy that's more kind of directly like social emotional learning-y um, is giving students space to just simply talk about how they're feeling. And it doesn't have to be like deep, profound. We're not trying to do therapy. Um, no. But a space where, people, where, where, where kids can share kind of how they're feeling in any particular moment. Like, and this could be, this could be individual between a student and a teacher, or it can be a, be a whole class check-in. Um, but that there's giving kids that opportunity to talk and share their feelings is, is important because they may not have that anywhere else. That's not something that we can, we can, we can assume, we, we may not have that anywhere else either. Um, that's not a thing that, that is kind of comes standard in our, in our culture is, is a place to, to, to talk mm -hmm. and, and share that out. And yet that can be really powerful. It's a way for kids. It does a few things. It, one, it lets them practice kind of emotion recognition and talking about it and, and building up emotion vocabulary, which is really important. Um, it normalizes having emotions when you hear your friends talking about it, when you see your teacher talking about it or your counselor talking about it. It normalizes feeling these different ways, which can help. Um, and just by by being able to express things openly, it helps process it. It gives students a space mm -hmm. in school where they are safe a safe space to talk about these things and they can process them, which is which is critically important right now. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, Matt, um, for those of you too, that if you struggle with also just you as yourself as an educator, maybe being okay with talking about like, hey, how are you feeling? What's going on? Um, uh, you know, with SEL, it's just not, an, it's not isolated. It, it, it is cross curriculum. You can apply it to almost every single assignment that we're in um, and, with that, for example, if, if I'm assigning a mathematics equation for the first time and I'm going to teach this process and there's symbols and there's um, a multi-step process that is very intimidating because no one's ever seen this length of a math, which would be very intimidating to me, just basically saying, okay, how does this make you feel seeing this? We're going to learn it. You've never seen it. How does it make you feel? Some kids may be very prepared to be like, I can do it. I can take on the world. I can do hard things. And then other students may just communicate that they're absolutely terrified. And um, we have to get over it and work through those boundaries. So then we can build that belief those beliefs and those values that we can do this as a group, we can do this together and we can do hard things, um, but, it, and then be able to reflect on it. So, you know, it's, I always look at it part of the curriculum too, with, and especially with literature coming with a, from an English and library science background. Um, so many emotions and experiences are shared through literature and reading. So how that applies with SEL is really important to me. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm wondering um, if you have any other um, any other specific examples of things that you might do in a remote classroom um, that you uh, that just wouldn't be possible. I mean, I know that we talked about Zoom rooms and that kind of thing, but um, kind of reframing this, um, looking at remote learning from this you know terrible thing that's happened um, during. And instead, as a um, you know, as an opportunity for us to use technology to communicate, what are do you have any ideas about specific things that um, you know being in these remote classrooms actually enable us to do? Yeah. There's something I've seen that I've been really actually really excited about as I've observed in in uh, classrooms doing social emotional learning is seeing the real the real power of doing asynchronous stuff, just like Colleen was talking about, Flipgrid is a great platform for this, but you can also do it more simply with like like discussion threads and Google Classroom, places like that. But but doing asynchronous discussions, um, I, I confess I was would never have, I would never have in my wildest dreams have said this was something I would recommend uh, for social emotional learning, uh, but I've seen it and I think it's amazing um, because when you take that, when you slow things down, like Colleen was saying, um, and, and you, what you, what you give kids the chance to do is they give a chance to think. So you give them, so let's say you, you have a short video or a lecture or whatever on a, on a social emotional learning topic uh, and like, like, like problem solving or managing, managing anxiety. And then instead of having a classroom discussion like you would have had originally, you, instead you take that discussion question and you place it online and kids participate, it, participate kind of on their own time. And what I've seen is two things, one, a lot more thoughtful answers um, and from, from students when they have the time to kind of put it together and process what they're thinking about. And two, participation from students that never would have participated before. Um, and so that, so, that, so that what's happening is that sort of, that, that more students are actively engaging with the, with the content. Um, and, and it's really, that's really cool to see. Um, it's something I hope we don't lose as we move back into classrooms after this pandemic uh, abates yeah, and trying to realize why those students that are now more participatory um, when they're removed from the classroom. So then when we're back in the classroom, continuing that participation um, and understanding as teachers why, because now we have a different perspective of observation. Uh, these students who, uh, especially in the older ages, who are journaling so much more, why is that happening now and having those conversations with students? Why did you participate so much more when we were remote and not everyone was around you? What stress is the classroom causing us while we're here? And just having that, that communication and we all, we all have seen it in classrooms. We walk into a, a classroom and there's mutual respect. Everyone's working um, or people are focused when someone talks other people listen, um, showing those signs of, of listening and affirmations. Um, whether or not they say, hey, I'm doing SEL, that's what's happening in there. Um, and it's important to recognize it and see it and then be able to, to spread that throughout your, your facility and buildings and school buildings. On a different note, I think it's really interesting how teachers are really boiling down their content to making sure like the core nuggets get across and they're learning new ways to teach that to kids. And I think that's something that I'm really excited about is that a lot of teachers, even though this is a really hard time to be a teacher, they are growing and stretching and trying to teach every which way to see what works and some really mm -hmm. amazing strategies have come out of it. Um, teachers are using apps and tools and amazing new ways to reach their kids, mainly out of desperation, but some really mm -hmm. cool things are coming from it that I'm hoping that same fire will still be there, maybe in like a much smaller role once all this is done, but that um, we'll see that there is a lot of room for innovation and for teachers creating their own content and not necessarily just going to like teachers pay teachers and just buying the thing to fit the need, which is great and has its place. But I love that teachers are creating their own custom content for their kids specific needs. And I think students that are your atypical learners, there is a certain set of students that is like succeeding during this time because this mm -hmm. is meant for them. <laughs> and it's interesting to see because they might not have thrived in a typical classroom. Yeah, and with the recording feature, having students um, alleviate that stress from having to be 
um, on point right there to learn, they can go right. over something four times at different times of the day to understand a concept, or if they're still not getting it, communicating and being able to share it a different way. Where when you know it's when we're in the classroom, it's just it's all attention is there. Um, so that's really nice too. I know even for my daughter being able to reread a book that was shared uh, and go through and pause and stop. There are there are those positive things um, that I see even with my seven year old. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great lead in to um, my next question, which is um, which is about parents um, and how parents can talk to their children about their social emotional health. I mean, I know that, um, you know, with an, with an increased focus in the classroom um, about talking about the importance of social emotional health, um, you know, when the classroom is now um, also home, um, what can parents do and are there techniques that they can use um, both in the virtual classroom and at home to that, that, that revolve around some of these SEL strategies? So there is so much that parents can be doing. Um, that's, that is my niche. I create programs and supports for parents and caregivers doing remote and hybrid learning with their families. Um, I think the biggest challenge though is therapy and that sort of like therapy talk and talking about feelings and emotions. Um, it's becoming more normalized now, but was not necessarily as normalized when we were growing up. So we may feel awkward talking about it, talking about our feelings, but to our kids, it's kind of a different animal because they are a different generation that are um, being exposed to different things. Um, through the SPARK program, and we're going to show the resources on some slides at the end of our session today, um, we have a lot of resources built specifically for parents about remote learning. Um, one of the ones that I really love, we've got um, a podcast and webinar, actually two episodes that are dedicated specifically to what is social emotional learning and how does stress impact the brain. Um, so a little bit about what we've talked about today so far. And then we also took that content and expanded on it and made it a it's a free five-part asynchronous course that walks parents through how can they address their own social emotional learning so that they can address their students' social emotional learning. So it's sort of a, a two-fold approach. It's done really well. Um, Abby Lyons, the educator that I mentioned earlier, she custom created all of the content for us. So it's not stuff they're going to find in other places on the internet, but it is so parent and pandemic focused that I think it's really useful for parents and educators now. Even if you're an educator who is not a parent, it can be great for you to go through and, and do yourself so you can see a bit of what parents are dealing with at home. I think one of the, something that I've seen work well, um, especially for helping families support younger kids, uh, social emotional learning is to not, is to not think of it as something that you're doing with the student, but to think of something you're doing with the family. Um, and how can you, how can, how can you get families working on this and talking about this together? Um, you know, that's also not necessarily going to show up as a synchronous thing because parents are not necessarily going to be able available to sit down at a particular time with, with their kid to be able to do this. But there's a lot of neat resources out there that are, that are shareable that you can give families that are, that are designed. And, um, Colleen was just sharing a couple of hers. There's a couple on my slide that's going to come up at the end that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of them is a podcast called Imagine Neighborhood which is designed for, to teach social emotional learning skills uh, that, um, that families are supposed to listen to together. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it's been, and it covers a lot of really topical things. They've been talking about issues around being at home, bound the pandemic and being at home, um, being, dealing with stress and anxiety. We're we'll be doing a whole series on, 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 on racial bias and racism coming up in, in February. Um, it's real fun. You don't know you're learning social emotional learning uh, until you, while you're listening to it, but you are. Your kid is learning it. The parents are learning it. Um, another one that, that, that families can do together on their own time is something called Mind Yeti, which is a mindfulness program. Mm -hmm. um, that again, I have linked to at the end of this. That is, again, designed for a family member to turn on with their kid and learn together, um, learn and practice it. Mindfulness is a, is a great strategy that families can use to uh, to to manage stress and and handle kind of all of all of the things that are going on right now. So there's a couple couple resources I'd recommend just to kind of get families doing this together. 
Yeah, and just to add, you know, to the group, I know as a mom with two children at home and, you know, working the majority of the day, I get home and I... I sometimes forget to take my shoes off, you know, so um, just because I have to get in the in the rhythm of now restarting my day and I only have three hours to do that with my family. So um, there's days that go by that I may even stop and not forget, realize like, oh my gosh, I didn't even ask how was your day, let alone talk about feelings. Um, however, I will say that in the process of doing homework has been a really good strategy for me because when my daughter gets frustrated, those are those moments that I can model. And then when I get frustrated because I haven't yet taken my shoes off, I am modeling those breathing techniques. I'm, I'm modeling taking 10 steps back. Um, when Lily's getting frustrated over her schoolwork, well, what, what is about this that's frustrating you? And that's when we really can communicate. And just remember, communication is not always verbal. It can be through drawing. It can be through um, a, her coloring that she's doing. It can be through, hey, find a picture, you know, of an animal that you feel like you can identify with and why. Why is it? And then that kind of trickles down. Um, I just heard something the other day, the difference between presence and being present and I think that social emotional learning at home really takes place when we're present with our student, when our, with our child, when we're just sitting down and we unplug and we say, okay, for the next 20 minutes, my attention is going to you and being conscious of it. Um, at least that's something that I know I can personally identify with. And then once we can experience social emotional learning, we then are able to bring it to school to really be able to get other people on board with it. Cause that's what, that's what we need. We just can't say, here are some strategies, use them in the classroom, and then expect people to, to take to it. We have to really um, believe in it as a value that it works in our schools and with our own families. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, um, that is a great uh, lead in for us to talk through some of the resources that we've also put together for um, all of the participants here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again um, and give everybody the opportunity to, to just talk through the resources that they have included. Um, so again, I will be sending out um, this, this um, webinar as a or this roundtable as a recording after this session. Um, and then I will also be sending out this slide deck. So um, all of these are linked and um, every Everybody who is watching or who is interested has access to all of these resources, all of which are free. So in, from Impero, um, actually Holly and I uh, worked together on this ebook earlier this year about supporting student mental health and safety during remote learning. It was, um, it was written um, with Holly's help as well as a former DARE officer in Missouri about um, signs for recognizing uh, child abuse and neglect um, when children aren't showing up for school. Um, we also have free software available for uh, managing student safety concerns in a central secure record called the Hero Backdrop. Um, and then we also offer cloud-based classroom management, device management, and filtering solutions for schools. If you have any questions or if you're interested in learning more about Hero or what we do, I have my contact information here. And then... Go to the next slide. There we go. Oops. Oh, I'm next. You're next, yes. Okay. So, um, so I just talked about Imagine Neighborhood and Mind Yeti, which you can see down there in the bottom. But I also want to talk, kind of, circle back to the, this idea of community building, and I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of need for need for really like, really intentional community building right now uh, among in, in, at the school level. Uh, and Community for Children, the organization I worked for, has put together a number of a number of guides around this, depending on kind of what what where you are uh, in your what what kind of teaching and learning you're doing if you're remote, hybrid, in person. Um, so we have these class meeting guides and advisory guides, depending if you're at the elementary or the middle school level to help kind of build intentional community building into a remote learning environment if, you're, if your students are all online. Um, and then we have these community rebuilding units, which are units of instruction that, um, that, uh, that, that, that are all about Kind of how do we rebuild community as we come back into classrooms or in our hybrid environments? How can we how what what can we do to like really kind of intentionally bring people back in and reestablish those connections that are so critical to student success? Um, if you open them up, you'll see their branded second step, which is the which is the which is the social emotional learning program that Committee for Children publishes. But everything out there is completely standalone. 
uh, and and free to use. And so please feel free to take it and share it and use it. Uh, and also, if you are a high school educator or have friends who are high school educators, those middle school those middle school um, resources, I think, will work pretty as a, as the person who wrote them and also a former high school teacher. I feel like they will work pretty well at a high school level as well. Thanks, Matt. You, Colleen. All right. So these are all, I, we have a lot of resources at the Spark program. Um, when you do get this slide deck, that first link, the remote learning library, um, is the sort of catalog. It's continuously updated with all of the resources that we have available. Um, the one that I am working on the most right now is our parent podcast, where we're tackling a lot of issues that we've talked about today. I think about half of our issues or half, half of our episodes so far touch on something we've talked about today. We also have one coming out later this week with Susie Allison of busy toddler Instagram fame, um, where if you are working with little people, especially on some of the, the social emotional skills, we do talk about that um, and how you can teach those soft skills to your kids who might be missing out on school this year. Um, we have things like on-demand webinars. We have technology troubleshooting, if that's something that your school, your district is looking for support on. But we also have that self-paced parent course called Parenting in a Pandemic. And we have our what we call our district toolkit because all of the resources that you can find on the Spark program are completely free and they are designed to be shared. So um, we pull the, the ones that are specifically designed for districts to then share out to parents um, into our district toolkit. And that's got things like um, a school or district check-in form that schools can use either on a you know, semesterly or quarterly basis, or there's a shorter one they can use on a weekly basis to be checking in with their um, stakeholders, their families, to make sure that everybody's safe, everybody's healthy, everybody's doing okay, doesn't need supports. Um, there are infographics you can send out. There's there's just so much stuff on there. Um, I'd love to work with your district if you need parent support, even if you are not from the state of Illinois, more than happy to talk you through this. Um, my contact information is at the bottom of the page there, and you can also get to any of our resources by clicking on these links when you get the slide deck. Great. And then we also just wanted to put together a couple more resources um, just for parent um, advice and teacher reference um, from um, a few well-researched, um, well-put-together um, pages um, for parenting advice and teacher advice. So um, Holly and Colleen, I don't know if there's anything additional that you wanted to say about these resources. I had suggested the three parenting um, accounts there. They're both Facebook and Instagram. I really like that they break down some of the concepts that we've talked about today into very small, bite-sized, actionable chunks that you can implement in your life. And I also like that I know that they're researched. They are not um, some, you know, Instagram influencer uh, that, you know, may or may not actually know what they're talking about. These are accounts that are run by um, licensed clinical people who have done the work. They, they know their stuff and they are giving you good sound advice that you know you can trust. Yeah, um, I, I added the virtual mind, uh, mindfulness room. It was something I've actually seen Colleen actually share with me um, and a school was looking for it. And I just want to take a moment to, to mention here that there are so many amazing elements of SEL that, and practices like um, desk stretches or guided imagery, positive self-talk, uh, mindful meditation. There's all these things that we can do, but if we just tell people to do them, it's not going to work. So, you know, just leaving with this, I say for you as an adult, practice it, practice it first for you and, and see if it's something that works for you. And if it works, apply it to your family. And if it works there, apply it to your building. And then um, with your teachers, with your support staff, with um, your admin, um, all of your staff, uh, cafeteria, everyone, and then trickle it down to the students. Um, because in order for this, I believe, for it to really take place, and there's so much power in it, and there's so much productivity in it, and I'm sure Matt and Colleen have seen it, um, for that to happen, though, that, that it is a core value there that, that we're talking about. And 
And like Matt said, with that 11% research, um, when it's done right, it's, it's done with, um, with great improvement for our students. And really, it, it's this, this skill that they're going to take throughout their lives that I know that it is part of my, my value. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or if you want to have a conversation, um, I'm definitely here to help um, any of you on the call and beyond. Excellent. Well, I just wanted to say thank you um, to our part to to our panelists, uh, Holly Kelly, Matt Pearsall, and Colleen Kaplan. Um, we're really, really fortunate to have um, all of you, all of you here, um, talking about each of your individual organizations and sharing your knowledge um, with all of us. I also want to thank everybody who has um, who has sat with us. I know that we're a little bit over our forty-five minute roundtable, but I hope that it was all um, interesting information and helpful information for everybody watching and also thank you for everybody who is watching the recording afterwards so as I have said um, I will be sending out the recording um, in an email afterwards um, and I'll also be out sending out the slide deck that has links to all of these resources for free for you to use in your districts um, so please um, look out for those emails and then I will also um, I'll be sending a survey as well um, just to, to hear how you found the session um, and then um, give you the opportunity to um, put in ideas for sessions in the future. So thank you again um, to Holly, Matt, and Colleen, and to everybody who's watching. It's been really nice to talk to you this afternoon and looking forward to doing it again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.